like to welcome everybody here today to our second talk in our Curious Minds series of, of writers and speakers and ideas. For the time being, these are virtual, unfortunately, but this today actually works out quite well because we were able to have our speaker on, on campus, so to speak, because it's virtual. So that's a good thing. Uh, you can see some of the past events we've had here on our beautiful campus, and we will have those again. But for today, um, <clears throat> we have Corey Robin on uh, campus with us from New York City. And um, this entire series, for those who are new, is premised on a simple, a simple idea. And that idea is that talking about books is as important educationally as are the books and the subjects themselves. More on Corey, our speaker for today, in a bit. Uh, next week, we have a talk, not by Walter Isaacson, don't get too excited, but uh, by myself, as well as a couple of Honors College students, Catherine Doolin and Angelica Bernal, we are going to discuss a book that we all three read this summer, The Code Breaker on Jennifer Doudna, Gene Editing, and the future of the human race. And we very much hope that you'll participate in that discussion. It's gonna primarily be discussing a discussion about uh, the ethics of gene editing. And uh, we want you there to uh, take part in that. So today's uh, format is very, very simple, really. And it's actually a little bit of a different format than what we usually do, although we have done it before. Uh, now that I've introduced the series, Corey and I are going to <clears throat> simply do a Q&A for about 35, 40 minutes. And uh, I'm gonna ask him a few questions about his book, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas, which I recommend that everyone read, buy and read. Uh, more on that in a bit. And while we're talking, uh, Corey and I, please ask questions and simply type them into the chat. And when we're done, we will bring your questions to the fore. And I think I can even uh, bring your, uh, your camera up if you want. I think I have figured out how to finally do that with WebEx. Uh, so after the Q&A is over, we'll have a student, faculty, staff, and community members ask questions for about 15 or 20 minutes. Should be done in about an hour. So uh, Corey Robin, he's the author of several books, Fear, The History of an Idea, and the Reactionary Mind, Conservatism from Edmund Burke to Sarah Palin and Donald Trump. He's published on a wide range of topics, um, including uh, Hobbes, Schmidt, Arendt, and Friedrich Hayek, uh, liber liberalism, libertarianism to the politics and practice of free, free speech. His articles have appeared in the American Political Science Review, Social Research, Theory and Event, the London Review of Books, Harper's, Jackman, and The Nation. Robin has received many grants and awards, including the best first book in political theory from the American Political Science Association and fellowships from the Russell Sage F Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies and Princeton University Center for Human Values. At least according to his faculty website, and he can correct this with us verbally if he wishes, he's currently writing a book on the political theory of capitalism, a counter history of the free market that looks at, among other figures, Burke and Smith, Slaveholders in the Old South, Theorists of Fascism, and the Contemporary Exponents of Neoliberalism. He's an active, active blogger at his own blog, blog CoreyRobin.com, and at Crooked Timber. And that is all on the introduction. And let me start by saying, Corey, welcome back to Lone Star College. You came here in 2011, I believe, to discuss your book, The Reactionary Mind. And uh, we had a good time then. And so the first question I have for you today is a very simple one is, why did you write a book about Supreme Court Justice Thomas? And why did you entitle it The Enigma of Clarence Thomas? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to be, you know, quote unquote, back. I, I actually wish it were in person because I remember that as one of the better a more memorable campus visit, so I, I appreciated your hospitality. But anyway, it's great to be back here. Um, I, I got into this book a little bit by accident. I won't get into the, the details of all of that, but as I began finding out more about uh, Justice Thomas, 
I was struck by the mismatch between what people know about him and the reality of who he is. If you were to ask people, what do you know about Clarence Thomas? I suspect they would say two things. One is Anita Hill. And maybe for younger people that even that name might seem, uh, you know, ancient history, but at least for people of our generation, Anita Hill, who was the a woman who accused him of sexual harassment that you know ended up blowing up the Supreme Court hearings uh, when he was nominated. And the other thing they would know about him is, is that he never speaks from the bench. He never asks questions. Um, what they don't know is, um, as I argue in the book, that Thomas has a deep immersion in the tradition of black nationalism in this country. And that more than, and beyond that, that he's brought that tradition to the Supreme Court. And I think, you know, for me, it was that, as I say, that disjuncture between this figure who in many ways goes completely against all of our commonsensical stereotypes about African-American uh, political thought and conservatism, he, he, he really throws those into um, question, the, 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 the things that we associate with those traditions, um, and that nobody knows about it. So the epigraph of the book is drawn from Ralph Ellison's famous book, Invisible Man. And I'll just quickly, it's short, I'll just uh, read it right here. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings themselves or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. And Clarence Thomas is in many ways the invisible man of the Supreme Court. And that the enigma of Thomas is how, how did that, how has that come about? How is it possible that this man who has such a rich political tradition behind him and that is right there in his Supreme Court opinions, right? It's not hidden anywhere, it's right there. How has somebody like that gone so unnoticed despite at this point being the longest mem serving member of the Supreme Court? Yeah, that's hard to, uh, that dates me to, <laughs> say that, to say that it's hard to believe that's the case. Corey, you, you published this book a couple of years ago, and of course, a lot has changed in a couple of years in terms of COVID, and we've had a presidential election since that time. Is there anything that you would change or add or revise in the book, or do you think that the, the argument of the book that you laid out there has held up really well? Oh, I think not only has it held up well, it's become stronger. I mean, another one of the enigmas or puzzles of this book is, how does the figure like Thomas, and we can get more into this and why I believe this to be the case, but who has, as I say, these very strong black nationalist tenets at the heart of his jurisprudence. How does a figure like that come to be Donald Trump's favorite Supreme Court justice? That is before T Trump appointed three other Supreme Court justices. Mm -hmm. You know, we associate Donald Trump um, with, you know, a kind of very hard right, um, racial backlash tradition of conservatism, uh, and rightly so. So how does a figure who, like Thomas, who represents in part this black nationalist tradition, have such appeal to figures like Trump and a lot of supporters of the Republican Party who would probably never consider themselves to be black nationalists? And the conclusion I come to is, is that both of these groups, these kind of white nationalists, let's say, and black and, and the kind of right wing or the kind of black nationalism that Thomas espouses really believe that racial conflict, the division between the races is a permanent feature of American life. Um, and I think in you know the last couple of years, I think that sense has gotten even stronger uh, in this country. And so what I say at the conclusion of the book is that Thomas is in many ways probably the most significant public thinker of our moment. And again, I think that would come as a big surprise um, to people both on the right, but also even more so on the left. Yeah. Uh, so you would argue that he's perhaps the most important African-American thinker in the United States. I, 
you know, I would maybe push this even further and say he might be the most important thinker in the United States. But let's oh. start with your well, let's start with your first claim about African American thinker. I mean, there's a great irony, I think, at our current moment, which is this is, you know, the moment of Black Lives Matter and of listening to black voices. And so there's been this very welcome, I think, change in curricula, in the media, where, you know, there's a real major focus on black issues and black voices and black traditions in a way that was not really the case, I would say, up until quite recently in this country. And what shocks me is that here you have the figure who is the most powerful African-American person in the United States. As we said, he's the longest uh, serving justice of the Supreme Court. Many of his positions, which were long dismissed as extreme and avant-garde, now are increasingly commanding large pluralities, if not majorities in the Supreme Court. He really has a claim to being the most powerful um, and influential African-American voice, and yet most people haven't a clue as to what he thinks about. So I think, you know, in that respect, he's quite important. But the reason I would push this, you had said maybe the most significant African-American thinker, I think, you know, most significant American thinker precisely because he has such a bleak and bitter vision of these cleavages of race, of capitalism and of gender, which really are, inform a lot of the, the discussion in the book, and articulates them in a in a in prose that is very plain spoken. There's nothing fancy about the prose. He's a very effective rhetorician. Um, you know, you, anybody could read his opinions. They're extraordinarily clear, which is not true of most Supreme Court opinions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I think you know, in that respect, he's just at the front lines at some of the most cutting questions of American politics, American political economy, and American political culture. So. I, you know, I would, I would even elevate him more um, than than many might, and I, and I should say, just in case you know the listeners don't know, you know, I, I I'm very much on the left. I am not a sympathizer with Thomas's views at all. So this is not coming from a desire to rehabilitate him or to kind of exalt his views, um, but to say, you know, that we we misread and we ignore him at our peril. Okay, well then you've kind of segued into my next question, which is you divide the book into three major sections, uh, race and capitalism, and then the constitution. And of course today, in addition to me and my brother's birthday is constitution day in the United States. Uh, and so I wanted to ask, why did you choose those categories of analysis? Well, for two reasons. Um, the first is that I think they, well, let me step back for a second. If you read a lot of uh, books and articles, uh, particularly by law professors, and this is no slight against them, uh, but about Supreme Court justices and their opinions, they tend to hew to a very conventional um, narrative or, or analytical frame. You know, for every clause in the Constitution, the Commerce Clause, uh, the Free Speech Clause, uh, the due process clause, there is a large body of precedent and of doctrine that guides, you know, or structures how Supreme Court justices and, and judges rule. And so if you read a, a, a legal analysis by a, a law professor or by a journalist, they're pretty much dedicated to just say, well, what does Thomas think about the due process clause? Does he abide by this precedent or that precedent? Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's very hard when you're, when you're, approaching a, a, a Supreme Court justice like Thomas in that way to get what is the larger social view? What is the larger political universe, the political cosmology that is embedded in what often seems like these very dry, these very arid uh, legal texts, which, you know, with, with these very arcane debates about the meaning of this and that and the other. And so I needed an approach that rather than following that order from the first amendment, you know, from, uh, you know, from the we the people to, to, you know, whatever amendment we're up to these days, the 27th or 26th, rather than doing it that way, to find the categories that make sense of Thomas's worldview. And I approach him not strictly as a legal thinker. In fact, I think if, if you approach him that way, you really miss a lot of what's going on, but as a political thinker. And so to do that, it was you know, very clear to me that race was the first and primary category 
that capitalism was the second category and that the con and constitution, not even just the constitution, but ideas of constitution were the third. Let me just add one more thing to that, which is that this is also a biography of the man. And here again, I try to change the way we do biography. Most biographies follow a narrative, a chronological frame. Mm -hmm. um, but it struck me that once I came up with this triptych of race, capitalism, and constitution, that that also told the story of Thomas's life. In other words, the first political idea and reality he comes to as a young boy growing up in the South and then a young man in the integrating North um, is race. Race is the foundation of his political experience um, and biography. As he gets a little bit older and starts moving to the right, he starts thinking very hard about capitalism and the state. And then in the 1980s, as he's preparing himself to get a position on the Supreme Court, or at least in the courts, he starts thinking about the Constitution. So it, it actually narrated his political evolution and his personal development as a man and a thinker as well. So that's why I chose to organize the book in that way. Okay, so for our audience then, we will spend the remainder of our time talking about these three categories, race, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, capitalism, and the U.S. Constitution. And so, Corey, let's, let's start with race. We do have one audience member who has asked, and I'll, I think this is probably a good point to have you do this. Could you just give a quick definition of what you mean by black nationalism? Sure. Now, the conventional understanding of black nationalism is that it has two primary beliefs. Um, well, three, I should say that black people are a distinctive people, separate and apart uh, from other ethnic groups, other racial groups in America, that they are a distinctive people with their own fate and destiny that sets them apart from other people in the United States. Um, and that, they, that, that that destiny and that fate cannot be integrated into the United States in a, in a fundamental way. And the way traditionally, you know, the more familiar version, versions of black nationalism have been expressed is in two ideas. One is territorial self-determination, that black people need either their own country, somewhere outside of the United States, and of course, they're famously, you know, back to Africa movements, the Liberian experiment, things of that sort. Or if you can't have a country outside of the United States, some kind of territory for self-determination within. So this was the idea of the black belt as a kind of sovereign nation of black people uh, within the United States. So territorial self-determination, and then lastly, some notion of the cultural unity of black people, that there's a kind of animating unity and spirit. Now, there is a whole new wave of revisionist scholarship that has um, said that, you know, even though those are really the defining features of black nationalism, most black nationalists as political actors in the United States, now you have to come down from the, you know, Martin Delaney, Marcus Garvey, uh, Malcolm X, you have to look a little bit more at the infrastructure, that they've, what they've, they've never really insisted upon a black, a separate black territory or absolute cultural unity. What they fall back on is some form of black separatism, some notion of black institutions, a critique often of the white state, um, black self-defense, and often a kind of very patriarchal vision of black male power. And if you come to this lower level, Thomas very closely fits the bill of, uh, of that kind of black nationalism. Now, he is not a leftist black nationalist by any stretch, although he once was. He's on the right. And so what's distinctive about his black nationalism is that it has a heavy dose of belief in the free market um, and also a kind of belief in what we call the carceral state. That is this part of the state that's about prisons and policing. Now, this may come as a surprise to people who say, well, black nationalists critiqued prisons and policing and were never capitalists. But in fact, again, if you look at the historical record, particularly of the 1970s, when Thomas was coming of age, many black nationalists were experimenting with the institutions of the market and were quite partial in some cases to the black, I'm sorry, to the carceral state. Um, so that's both what I think about black nationalism and gives you some sense of where Thomas might fit in, in into the tradition. Okay. Um, along these lines, you wrote in a New York Times piece when the book first came out, and I'll read the quote to you. 
you say you wrote just Justice Thomas is not by his own lights a conservative jurist who happens to be black. He is a black jurist whose conservatism is defined by the interests of black people as he understands them. Could you elaborate on that a little bit for us? Uh, this idea of, of Thomas as a who is a conservative, a black jurist whose conservatism is defined by the interests of black people as he understands them? Sure. So I think, you know, in a lot of conventional academic discourse about politics and about the you know, courts and, 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 and very much so now, there's a notion that if you're on the right, if you're on the left, excuse me, you are sympathetic to African-American claims, sympathetic, you I mean, at this point, you know, very much identify with African-American claims to rights and equality. And if you're on the right, uh, you tend to be hostile to those. And so, you know, there is a puzzle, which is, you know, where does Thomas fit in there? Here is this black person uh, who's on the right and very much on the right. And one possibility is to say, well, he's a traitor. He's a, he's a, he, or he's a, um, you know, oftentimes he was called, you know, an Uncle Tom, um, somebody who is essentially has betrayed black people. And there's very strong arguments for this that we can get into. I mean, I don't think that's a crazy view by any stretch. But what Thomas, I think, represents is a tradition of, like I said, black na a conservative black nationalism. And if you read him very carefully, um, it's very clear that black people are at the center of his whole worldview about the Constitution, about cases on racial equality, and that he sees himself advancing the cause of black people. Now, some people might say that's just insincere. He's just kind of uh, duplicitous when he says that. And I took that argument very seriously, but then comes the question, if it is so insincere, I mean, why do it at all? He doesn't, he's been on the court for 30 years. He has life tenure. There's no reason why he needs to consistently answer, uh, advance the, the centrality of African-American claims in his jurisprudence. Um, you could say maybe he did that just to get onto the court, but if it's such a cynical maneuver, you would have expected him to ditch that. Instead, yeah. it's become more and more central. And I think people on the left in particular and liberals, they, they end up um, making life a little too easy for themselves by dismissing him in this way. Because many of his beliefs, um, far from being eccentric, if you start digging into the historical record, as I said, reflected a lot of uh, the, the, the direction of black nationalism as it was developing in the 1970s. And so by, by excising and ignoring him, you engage in this project of, um, it kind of, you know, you whitewash uh, African-American history, as it were. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you divest it of all of its complexity and its variety. I think that this wasn't a question that I was going to ask, but it strikes me that part of what you're saying here, and I think you've said this in some other venues, if I'm not mistaken, that um, you don't, if I mischaracterize your stance here, please tell me, but you seem to have said that liberals don't do enough of reading conservatives and taking them seriously. And that in a strange way, I think you would agree with conservative critics of, of the academy who say that uh, we don't, as academics, take conservative ideas seriously enough. We're not reading them closely enough. Am I, I misunderstanding you there or? No, I mean, I think that's, that's very true I'll, with a caveat, which I'll explain in a second. But I do think, I mean, I, you know, as you know, I've been writing about the, the right for a very long time. And my work on the, on the right just simply began with teaching and saying, what the hell are these guys saying? Right. Um, right. And, you know, it surprised me in many ways. And likewise with, with Clarence Thomas. And I do think um, there is, you know, there's just definitely a tendency amongst a lot of journalists and a lot of academics to dismiss um, the complexity and the robustness of the social thought that animates the right and to dismiss it doubly so when it comes to a figure like Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. um, precisely because it's so easy to just discategorize him as, you know, as a kind of a traitor to his race or as an opportunist who just has forsaken African-Americans. The slight caveat is that I do think in the last 10 years, um, there has been an increasing interest or even 20 years on the, uh, in the right among liberal and leftist academics. Um, 
And I think that's been all to the good. The only concern I have about some of that is that they, I think, oftentimes engage in a kind of essentialist race talk that, again, doesn't look at the variety of thinking about race and the complexity of it that under, underlies a lot of thinking on the right and, you know, in general. Has, has Thomas spoken much about issues like systemic racism? Uh, I know he has with affirmative action, uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, could you maybe address that? So has he spoken much about current events that way? Yeah, I mean, there's a. It's funny that you mentioned that. I, as I mentioned to you at the very beginning, I was rereading this book because I haven't looked at it in a couple of years, and I've forgotten a lot of parts of it. There's a very important case, and I, I think, and I'll, I want to dwell on this a tiny bit because I think it shows you how Thomas works and why he's such an important and interesting figure. Um, it's actually out of Texas, in fact, so uh, uh, very close to home. Um, it's the Inclusive Communities Project case. And this is what's, uh, it's about a doctrine of the Equal Protection Clause called disparate impact. The conventional understanding of racial discrimination is if I'm a white person discriminating against a black person, I'm consciously thinking about them as black and preventing them from uh, advancing simply because they're black. It involves conscious intentional prejudice. Um, in the late 60s and early 70s, Many liberals and African American thinkers, and uh, you know, tried to complicate that notion, and they came up with. And it, it's embedded. This more complicated view is embedded in the Civil Rights Act. Uh, it's called disparate impact, and the idea behind disparate impact is is fairly simple, which is that racially neutral laws and principles and practices can nevertheless, because society is so racially structured, because of systemic racism, can nevertheless reproduce racial inequality, not by being consciously racist, but by being facially neutral, right? And that's the idea behind disparate impact. Now, most people on the right today reject the whole doctrine of disparate impact, right? The whole idea is so long as the law, the practice, or the policy is racially neutral, we don't have a problem. And Thomas um, supports that position, except in this, in this case, what was so interesting about his argument is it goes against what most conservatives say and fits very closely with how the left thinks about this. Very simply, Thomas's argument was, if we take seriously the idea of systemic racial inequality, which we do, which he does, then it makes no sense to hold a specific institution responsible for racism because it's not the fault of the institution that society as a whole is racially stratified the institution is, in a sense, a racial innocent. And so if you really want to deal with systemic racism, says Thomas, you can't blame a specific workplace. You have to look at the quote unquote system. And in a way, it's a very cynical argument because he lets any individual off the hook. But in a way, it mirrors, I think, certain systemic arguments on the left. And there's a whole complicated reason why that's so that I won't get into here. But but that's a longer answer to your question about this is what Thomas often does is he takes arguments from the left and repurposes them into very, very conservative positions. And again, you could dismiss that as pure opportunism or you could say, huh, why is it that these arguments are so easily repurposed by someone like him? And that's partly what I try to do in the book. Okay. Just for our audience, uh, keep in mind that you can uh, continue to put questions in the chat box. So that kind of segues, I think, into a discussion of capitalism. Uh, and let's talk about that for a bit. On page 103 in the book, you wrote, the defense of capitalism is not abstract for Thomas. It is personal. The telling and retelling of a family story in a political idiom when it comes to Thomas's ideology of black capitalism, race as being used as a sleight of hand, as a stand in for class. Could you elaborate on that for us? And what are what are Justice Thomas's deepest commitments regarding capitalism? And how does maybe your view of Thomas differ from previous writings? So I think there's two ways to think about this, and I'll start with the more personal biographical because I think it makes the ideas a little bit more concrete. 
Thomas is born um, not far in Pinpoint, Georgia, not far from Savannah in 1948, I think it is. So right after the end of the Second World War. Um, his father abandoned the family um, when they were quite young, I think when he was about five, leaving him with um, just his mom. And his mom couldn't um, raise her three kids. She just couldn't do it. So she put Thomas and his brother with her father, um, Thomas's grandfather. And this is one of the most sort of formidable uh, moments in Thomas's life. Um, you have to, so he was you know, born into deep poverty and squalor in many ways. And then in his view, he gets saved by this man, Myers Anderson, whom he calls daddy. And he, his memoir is, by the way, entitled My Grandfather's Son. He yeah. really sees himself as the son of his grandfather. Yeah. Now, why is that? Myers Anderson was um, a kind of a remarkable man. He was a black businessman in Savannah, um, a fuel delivery uh, company that he set up, but he expanded from there. He ended up owning quite a few properties as well. Extraordinarily successful. Um, you know, not super wealthy, but was able to provide Thomas with a home, uh, education at a private Catholic school, um, clean clothes every day, uh, you know, not the things that uh, people who are poor tend to have. And he did this in Thomas's view. Uh, he was able to do this because this was a black man who was a kind of very firm and stern figure of authority. This is a real black patriarch, a patriarch like out of the Old Testament kind of a patriarch, a very forbidding man, a very hard man, but a very principled man who is very stern in his rules. And Thomas, growing up, like many kids, hated it. But what he came to believe later in his life was that those firm rules and authority had saved him from a life of poverty. Uh, it taught him the habits of self-discipline, of hard work, of responsibility and that these are the things that the black community needs and the keystone of that for thomas is uh was uh myers his his grandfather's figure as a black businessman that that black entrepreneur as it were so when thomas thinks about politics when he thinks about econ the economy he really thinks that the most important figure is that black businessman the black entrepreneur and that that is the keystone for progress um, for black people. And he, he says quite, I mean, quite blatantly, the salvation of the black race depends upon the black man. And he means, you know, the black businessman. Mm -hmm. So that's the personal part of his story. But there's a political part that I think really should not go under uh, mentioned or not uh, unmentioned. And here, you know, I, I've, I've alluded to the fact that when Thomas is a college student, he is a black militant. He's a black radical. And, you know, I can go into the whole uh, story about that, but it's really quite incredible, you know, down to seeing photographs of him, you know, with the black power salute, leading a walkout of students from the university that he was attending in Massachusetts. You know, he was the, the full, the full uh, thing. He can recite speeches of Malcolm X. Um, he cites in his Supreme Court cases, you know, uh, statements from W.E.B. Du Bois and Frederick Douglass. So he's, you know, he's really steeped in this stuff. Um, but black power and black nationalism in the early 70s is a movement that is uh, in defeat. It's losing traction. And many black power activists really become interested in the economy uh, as, and in capitalism and black business as a way to, you know, advance the black cause. Get out of politics start building up black wealth, black business. There's passages in Malcolm X's autobiography that say this very explicitly, but you see it in the, the foundational meetings um, and foundations of, of the, the black power movement. And Thomas comes out of that moment. And so I think in addition to there being a biographical dimension to his focus on black business and the black businessman, there is also a political um, backstory that you know, scholars have begun to uncover, but has really gone underanalyzed and unmentioned. And so I think those are the two aspects that really uh, underpin his view of black capitalism. Yeah, this is, uh, <clears throat> this reminds me, we had Jason Riley of the Wall Street Journal on campus last year, 
And um, I looked up this quote, but Jason said, quote, human capital has proven far more important than political capital in getting ahead, end quote. Do you think Justice Thomas would agree with that? And why might he agree with that? Oh, he would definitely agree with that. He would go even further. Um, why would he agree with that? This is the other interesting part of his story. So he starts off on the left um, from the late 60s to the early 70s. And then he moves out after he graduates from Yale Law School to Missouri, to St. Louis. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, to Jefferson City, which is the capital. And he reads a book. He reads a book called Race and Economics by a black economist, black conservative economist called Thomas Sowell. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting book uh, that not many people really read who are not on the right uh, today. Because if you read Sowell, it's very clear he, he, he goes back to, to slavery. And the through line of the book is that the one thing that constrained white, the white master, the white slaveholder, the one force that the white slaveholder had to acknowledge and submit to was capital, the marketplace. So in other words, they could be as you know repressive and as tyrannical as they wanted but ultimately they were constrained by the marketplace, the, the need for profit. And Thomas, is, he says this book came to him like, you know, it was like, you know, manna in the desert, water in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, and it really transformed him. Um, and so I think, you know, that idea of, of what you just said about human capital is more important is really at the center. And let me just add one part of that though, because Thomas went even further than that. It's not just that human capital is more important than political capital. Thomas has a whole critique about politics and the state, about black involvement, whether it's through voting, through protest, whatever it may be, where he says, this ultimately politics in a country like the United States, a racist country with a white majority, black people will never ever be able to get a fair shake through politics. Here, I just wanna read quickly a quote. This is from 1987, by the way two years, uh, three years, excuse me, before he's appointed to the Court of Appeals by George W. H. W. Bush, four years before he becomes under the Supreme Court. So right in the middle of the Reagan administration, he says, blacks are the least favored group in this society. Suppose we banded together, group against group. Which group do you think would win? We're breaking down everything, 10% for the blacks, 25% for the women, 2% for the aged, everything broken out according to groups. Which groups always wind up with the least. Which group always seems to get the hell kicked out of it? Blacks, and maybe American Indians. Blacks. Black people will be on the bottom of any collective political effort. And so not only should they get involved in capitalism in the market, they have to get the hell out of politics. And, and I think a lot of this is what explains his hostility to voting rights. I mean, his, many people say, how can you say Thomas believes that he's supporting black people? Look at his voters rights jurisprudence. It's all very consistent, you know, and it's very consistent, I might add, with Marcus Garvey's belief, which was that black people should not participate in electoral politics. And that's what Thomas believes. Okay, wow. Well, let's, uh, this is going very quickly and questions are coming in and I want to ask those questions. So. Real quickly, the third, we've talked about race and capitalism. Let's move on to his view of the Constitution and at least introduce this um, to our audience. Unfortunately, it'll have to be in a somewhat cursory way, but you have chapters where this idea of Justice Thomas and the Black Constitution and Justice Thomas and the White Constitution. Could you talk to our audience a little more about what you mean by those terms? Sure. Basically, there, it's two, there are two constitutions, and this isn't just Thomas's views. This is actually very familiar to writers on the left. There's the constitution that was drafted and adopted in 1787 and 1789, um, the original constitution. And this is a white slaveholder constitution. And Thomas has basically said as much, interestingly enough. I call that the white constitution. Then there is the constitution that was transformed by the struggle over slavery and emancipation, which produced the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. And if you've taken a con law course as an undergraduate, you'll know 
that those amendments did not just emancipate African Americans and grant equality and all the rest, they really transformed the entire American political system in fundamental ways. And that's what Thomas, you know, very much believes is the black constitution. What's interesting about Thomas's thoughts, and I can get into this more, but in the interest of being quick, is that he believes in both constitutions. Most cons conservatives really subscribe to that first one, the white constitution. People on the left really believe in that second constitution and its transformations. Thomas, always mixing contradictory elements, believes in both. And that's what makes his jurisprudence so explosive and unpredictable. By the way, for the audience, I did uh, put in the chat uh, the name of Thomas Sowell, the economist, uh, an enormously influential figure on the right, certainly. Uh, and I would recommend that uh, people take the time to read uh, his books. Very, very much recommend that. Um, so on the towards the end of your book, but on page 159, you write that Justice Thomas has focused, quote, on three elements of the rights revolution, liberalization of criminal law, sexual freedom, and the welfare state. Could you talk to our audience a little bit about this? And I think this may have to be my last question so that we can get to audience questions, Corey. Sure. So many people on the right, uh, beginning in the 1960s and 70s, uh, opposed what they called the rights revolution. And this was the radical expansion of the liberal state uh, that began really under the New Deal. And for Thomas, there are three elements of that rights revolution that he focuses on. One rooted in the New Deal, which involves the welfare state, the expansion of, of, of the right to welfare, the right to subsistence, basically, the right to economic um, security. And so that's one element. The second come more in the 1960s. And one is, of course, the sexual emancipation movements, the sexual liberation movements, rights like abortion, rights to birth control, right? And then, you know, expanding today to things like gay rights, LBGTQ rights, sexual expression, and all the rest of it. The last is the criminal justice uh, reform movement, which expand, radically expanded the sphere of criminal rights and put restrictions on um, uh, policing and prisons. Now, Thomas opposes all of these uh, rights revolutions. And again, we can get into this more, but just to, I think the, the, the thing that he believes most about these things is that ironically, they did more to undermine the, the position of black men uh, than Jim Crow and slavery. Mm -hmm. Oddly, this is one of the most, the really the darkest, bleakest parts of his jurisprudence is the belief that under Jim Crow and under slavery, black men, because of the adversity they faced and the constraints around them, sort of rose up like a phoenix, these heroic figures who were able to survive and ultimately protect their families, particularly under Jim Crow. And again, Myers Anderson, his grandfather, is the figure he has in mind. Once liberalization comes about, um, black men start becoming weaker figures, like his father. Why does his father leave the family? I mean, think about that. His father leaves his family because of drugs. He, you know, abandons his wife and children, so sexual freedom, and is allowed to go north because of the changes in the American state. And so for Thomas, you know, this has been a catastrophe for the black community. Um, and so that's really what is at heart in his critique of these rights revolutions. Okay, we've got a lot of questions, Corey, and I'll start with one from one of my ex-students, uh, Eldridge. And Eldridge asked you this question. Um, when I was preparing for today's presentation, one thing that completely shocked me is that Justice Thomas believes white people are incurably racist. Could you please discuss this in more depth? Yeah. Um, it, it is shocking. And it's something that I think is very surprising to people. And it's um, something that you find in a lot of the speeches he gives in the 1980s, um, which remember, what's interesting about this is that this is now the 1980s. He's a figure in the Reagan administration. He's mm -hmm. on the right now. And he's saying white people are incurably racist. And he's not saying it in like these little cubby holes and seminars with a small group of people. He's saying it to a figure like Juan Williams in the Atlantic Monthly, 
Um, and he's also saying it to conservative figures like Reason Magazine, Libertarian Magazine. Um, and, you know, I think at, at the core of Thomas's belief is that racism, um, it's, it's very difficult to figure out what the roots of racism are. And because you can't figure out the roots of racism, you can't figure out how to uproot it. You can't figure out how to get rid of it. And he thinks the real problem with a lot of liberals is they think you can get rid of racism. Um, I should say this is liberals in the 60s and 70s and 80s. I think today, this view that racism is incurable, that you can't get rid of it, is actually quite frequently found on, among liberals and the left. There's a term for it, a term of art, you know, which we call Afro-pessimism. And um, it's a very influential school of thought. And in many ways, Thomas subscribes to it. And it's really a view of racism as this kind of human pathology of soul, for lack of a better word, that it's almost like original sin. You can't get rid of original sin. You can try to, you know, have acts of grace, you know, that occasionally take you away for it, from it. And I, I would urge people to think, you know, people on the left oftentimes talk about racism is the original sin of America. It's part of America's DNA. I've heard that. that. language, right, of the, you know, it's both biological and theological is so embedded. And the, the, the shocking thing is here you have a figure like Clarence Thomas and he believes pretty much the exact same thing. Well, okay, this is from <clears throat> another student. Um, to what extent does Clarence Thomas share the views of a Booker T. Washington or a Marcus Garvey or even a James Brown? Uh, <laughs> Uh, has he ever publicly spoken or written about any of these uh, men? Well, let me take the last one. He um, has a very bitter moment. I believe it. It's it's in his memoir. Um, but to explain it, I have to. I, I got to back up a second. So Thomas, okay. uh, you know, grows up in Savannah, and he's very dark skinned. And the first part of the color line that really he confronts is not from white people, it's from lighter skinned black people. And this is a very, very bitter memory for him. And it's something that's very difficult to talk about. Um, and frankly, as a white person, I feel uncomfortable, I have to say, talking about it, but it's true, it's called colorism. And it's basically a belief that, um, you know, darker black people are somehow lower class. Um, they're dirtier, they're more um, disposable whereas lighter skinned black people are part of the professional class. And Thomas, you know, this structures a lot of his worldview of his critique of black liberals, who he, ten he often will say are white, are light skinned. So you could imagine a figure like Barack Obama, for him just represents everything that he hates about black liberals uh, and who's light skinned and biracial. Anyway, the way it relates to James Brown is he has this very bitter comment in his memoir. He's like, you know, before everybody was saying I'm black and I'm proud and black is beautiful. Um, you know, here I had, you know, very nappy hair. And, you know, believe me, when I was growing up in Savannah and those schools with other black kids, black was not beautiful. Uh, so, you know, there's a there's an element there of James Brown. Uh, Marcus Garvey, definitely. Um, I've talked about mentioned his views on on, on the vote. Um, Marcus Garvey was also a firm believer in black capitalism um, and black business and the importance of black entrepreneurs. You know, the, 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 the Starship line that he uh, you know, advanced was a kind of vision of black international capitalism. Um, and obviously Booker T. Washington as well. There's a lot of resonance there. Um, and, you know, there's a whole scholarship that is now looking at kind of black nationalist elements of Booker T. Washington as well. Okay, here's another question. It's a good question. Do you think that the Tulsa massacre in 1921 suggests that economic power can't really overcome political power? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I should be very clear here. I, I sort of said this earlier, but I think a lot of these views of Thomas are, um, you know, uh, well, to put it simply, nonsense. Um, and when I try to kind of explicate them, I don't personally believe that they are uh, true. And I think this is a good example of how, you know, Du Bois's position ultimately, which is, you know, and Marx's position, the inextricability between economic and political power and the idea that you could have one without the other, I think is, is nonsense. However, and I want to really stress this, 
because it's easy to dismiss a view as nonsensical if you feel like you've worked it through on your own. But, but what's important is, you know, that view of, of black capitalism is not just Thomas's, right? There's a lot of people who think that, you know, the answer to a lot of problems are to kind of build up economic power and not to kind of get involved in politics. Um, that is not a, a kind of an extreme view. Um, and so I think we, you know, Thomas provides a kind of racial inflection to that, um, that we really need to confront. But that doesn't change the fact that I, I don't think that that view really holds much water in the end. Okay. This next question is from Kara. And Kara asks, Thomas once said, quote, the job of a judge is to figure out what the law says, not what he wants it to say. There is a difference between the role of a judge and that of a policymaker. Judging requires a certain impartiality. <clears throat> But as your book focuses on him as a black nationalist, are you arguing that he is impartial or not? Uh, and she goes on, let's see here. Or are you simply looking to describe his unique perspective as a right wing black nationalist? Well, I should say that I, I think this it's a hard question that's being posed here because um, it really goes to the heart of what do you think the act of judging is. And I teach constitutional law sometimes. And what I tell my students is this, is that judging and the law uh, and, 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 and the courts are a form of politics. And the idea that they're that judges are not political actors is nonsense. Thomas is not unique in being a political actor. Justice Sotomayor is a political actor. Justice Kagan, they're all political actors. They all have a political vision and the law and the courts are an, an instrument of that political vision. However, and this is the important second part of this, it's not just politics like you get on a television show or you know in a debate in Congress. It's not just anything goes. They have to follow certain kinds of rules and canons and norms including the rules and canons and norms that they've set up for themselves. And that means that the, while they are political, they are not simply partisan. And I think there's a different, you know, we have, a, we, we collapse those two categories too easily, political and versus and partisan. Um, it's a mistake to just think of Thomas as a simple Republican Party hack. I mean, sometimes he certainly sounds like it. I mean, I, I won't deny it. There are cases in which, you know, there's nothing interesting going on. He's just offering the standard put Republican Party program. But there are many, many cases where he infuses, as I say, this racially inflected black nationalist belief system that really structures his jurisprudence. And in that case, in those cases, he is not being a simple partisan actor. He is being a political actor, but again, not uniquely political because they're all political in that way. So your view, your distinction between political and partisan seems to align a little bit with what Judge Barrett said earlier this week in uh, her talk in Louisville about uh, the Supreme Court not being seen as partisan. Would you like to talk about that just a bit? I mean, I'm not, yes no. I'm not an expert on, on, on her jurisprudence, to be honest with you. Um, but when I saw that, you know, you know, I think it's basically right um, that, you know, but again, she would probably say that because she's not partisan, she's impartial and not political. And that's the part that I think is, frankly, BS. Um, you know, she has a, a systemic worldview and she's on the court to advance that view. But where I think liberals and leftists get it wrong is that periodically these guys, all of them, will rule in a way that surprises liberals. So Gorsuch comes out in favor of LGBTQ rights, let's say, mm -hmm. you know, very recently. And suddenly people are like, oh, he has integrity. Well, you know, integrity is not something that you have one day, you lose it the next day. He always has the integrity of his general political philosophical view. It's that sometimes that will produce outcomes that are not in sync with the actual program of the Republican Party. And that's also true of Thomas, and it's also true, I suspect, of Barrett, though I haven't studied her work closely enough to say for certain. Here's from another student. I'm an African-American, and when family discussions about the Supreme Court are brought up, most blacks seem to think they're a good marshal was the justice that did the most for blacks. Pretend for a minute you were my cousin Corey and came to the family reunion. How would you argue Thomas has just as much importance to blacks as Thurgood Marshall? 
I would do it the same way I do it with my family, just to keep my mouth shut and just smile. Um, but um, assuming I'm a different kind of person, um, let me start with something and then I'll, I'll get to the, the heart of that question and I'll be fast about this. It's interesting, you know, uh, people on the left talk about Thomas. They emphasize, you know, they, they say that he doesn't ask questions. They say that he's lazy. They say that he doesn't write his own opinions. Uh, they say that he deferred to Scalia. He was always called right. Scalia's puppet. All of these types of accusations, all of them, have only ever been leveraged against one other Supreme Court justice. Sleeping during the court, being a puppet of somebody else, lazy, doesn't write his own opinions. That other Supreme Court justice was Thurgood Marshall. Yeah. People forget this, but it is true that it wasn't just conservatives, but liberals as well made some of these very same specious claims about Marshall. So in one respect, I think there's a similarity. Um, but in other respects, I would say just a quick answer to, to, to my cousin um, is uh, I don't think that um, Thomas has advanced the cause of African-Americans. I think he's been quite deleterious. However, however, he is by far the most significant, I mean, as we said earlier, African-American voice in not only in the courts, but politically today. And I think that he reflects a wider view that is more pervasive throughout the Amer African-American community than many people want to acknowledge. So this idea of black male authority is, you know, is very pervasive among, um, I mean, not just African-Americans, but other communities as well. And I've had a lot of people um, come up to me during talks and say, you know, who are African-American and say, he sounds exactly like my father. He sounds exactly like my grandfather. Um, that, that guy, I know him really, really well. And so that's what I would say. It's not so much that he has advanced the cause of African-Americans, but that he is a significant voice in the African-American tradition. And you cannot pretend that it doesn't exist. Okay. I think we have time for two more questions and I'm gonna to reserve to myself the last question. So this next question is um, about all the uh, slogans that you see on, let's say NBA player shirts. I'm trying to read this correctly, as well as on the back of NFL football helmets saying in racism, et cetera. Does Thomas have a view on that sort of thing? Or would you think he, based on what you've read of his writings, is that significant? Those types of cultural, that cultural symbolism, I think. I hope I'm being fair to the questioner there. <clears throat> I think that's the kind of thing that Thomas really loathes, to be honest with you, is, is that kind of sloganeering, you know, and racism just on a t-shirt or something like that. Um, you know, he was very involved with the left. And one of the things that he came to really despise about the left was precisely that kind of, you know, performative politics. Now, of course, the yeah. right does it all the time. So I don't want to act like this is exclusive to the left. But I, I think it really, it, he finds it distasteful, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't think he would be, take kindly to it, although he does love sports. So. <laughs> right. Well, maybe that's why the question, you know. Uh, so the last question is mine, and um, in listening to you and in reading some of your, uh, reading your work, uh, it reminds me a little bit in the sense that, uh, you know, Orwell sometimes attacked people on the left as much as he did on the right. And um, do you see your work in that vein? Because you have quite a bit to say that I think is quite critical of liberals. So uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit and maybe, and then maybe tell our audience what you're working on next, and then we can be, we can conclude the session. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because you know before I wrote this Thomas book, I wrote this book about the right that um, that I think came to be embraced eventually by the left, um, although it wasn't initially. And you know, it, at, at the time, I um, didn't think much about this, but you know, I I I, I think uh, I think people on the left and liberals have gotten. Um, a little lazy about how they think about stuff. Um, and I think they've become themselves, you know, kind of, you know, sloganeering. Um, it's interesting, you know, we think, I think people on the left tend to think of people on the right as having no ideas and all the rest of it. And I, right. I sometimes feel like liberalism and even leftist thought is a little bit stuck. Um, you know, just think about, you know, the, the ideas, you know, the, the, you know, on the left, the Green New Deal. These are all things that come from, you know, 100 years ago. 
Um, you know, the idea of innovating and kind of inventing a new system of thought, socialism itself, you know, is a, is a very old idea. It goes back to the 19th century. So I, I do think that there's a kind of um, stagnation that I, I'm constantly bridling against, uh, increasingly so, on the left and among liberals. Um, in terms of my next book, you know, I'm hoping to write a book about capitalism um, and have been trying to figure out different ways of doing that. I'm, I'm doing a piece right now on the idea of late capitalism, which I think has become kind of a, a bit of an idea on the left. So that's what I'm working on. And, and I hope um, it will sort of challenge, again, some, some ideas, uh, you know, on the left as well. Thank you, Corey. I would want to hold up the book again to our audience, The Enigma of Clarence Thomas by Corey Robin. I would certainly encourage everyone to buy and read this and give serious thought to the ideas behind Thomas's jurisprudence. A reminder as well to dig into the works of Thomas Sowell, uh, also a very important uh, economist, uh, still alive, I should say, as is Thomas. So uh, I'd like to thank the audience for coming and Corey, thank you very much for your time. No, thank you, I really enjoyed it. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.